Hello, everyone. Welcome again to uh, episode 40 of The Raw Men. And today we've got uh, one of my favorite people. This is uh, Rebecca Witzman. And she has a, she's a very powerful story. When I, I like to talk to progressive people, I like to talk to people that are getting out and fixing things and you know, making the world a better place. And this is one of those people. So this is one of my opportunities to actually do what I want to do in that regard. Rebecca, how are you? I am doing well. How are you? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. So uh, go ahead and bring us in on who you are and how you got to be. Where are you? Okay. Um, ooh, where do I start? Wow. That I would think, like I would so think that, that, that that whole windstorm thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. One time. Which one? No, <laughs> I'm from Louisiana, so there's been a few, but only one of them uh, affected me in such a way that I am doing what I'm doing today. Uh, so... For some people might know, but my house got destroyed by a tornado in 2013. Um, shortly thereafter, I was contacted to be on CNN because I saved my son and my life uh, because <laughs> we almost got killed. <laughs> um, we made it out with about, I made it about three quarters of a mile outside of the destruction area before it destroyed everything, so I didn't make it very far, uh, but I did, I made it, ha! Huh. And so I got put on CNN, uh, and at the end of the nine minute interview, uh, Wolf Blitzer tried to have my son close. He said, you know, uh, Anders, say, I, I'm Anders and this is CNN. And Anders had been repeating things earlier in the day, but he was not having any of it, so Wolf went for a different close. Um, <laughs> where he asked me if I thanked the Lord, <laughs> uh, and I said that I was an atheist, and then that went viral. <laughs> well, I said, I'm actually an atheist, but I don't blame anybody for thanking the Lord, because I don't, you know, it's fine, they can thank the Lord, you know, they can think positive thoughts about me being alive, that's nice. <laughs> now, the story about the, the tornado taking your house, I mean, I've, I've heard you I've heard you go into detail on that, and that was a uh, that was an that was a epic tale that okay. you went into about that. But the story about Wolf Blitzer and and your comment to him, you, the gravity of what you said to him wasn't just that you that you said this thing on TV. It's it as I remember, none of your family yet no. knew. No, I was not out. Like my family didn't know. My friends didn't know. The only people I had ever said the word I you know, atheist too, in reference to myself, were other atheists who came out first. And then I was like, oh, me too. Or I would go to an atheist meeting and, you know, I knew they were all atheists and I could be like, well, I'm not out, so don't say anything, you know, don't post things <laughs> on my Facebook, you know. Um, yeah, somebody once posted, you know, nice to see you last night, heathen, and I like immediately like deleted it and I was like, ah! you know somebody might see the word heathen and think something weird about me you know i right i was very closeted so your family is watching <laughs> they're seeing you on they're seeing you on cnn that's got to be a big deal right they're seeing you know, right no my husband's grandparents were watching <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> my husband's mormon grandparents were watching this <laughs> and <laughs> uh but i'm not a liar and i've never been have my parents ever asked me I would have said I was an atheist. Like one time my mom said, Becky, are you, you know, have you been going to church? And I laughed and I said, you're funny mom. Uh, I've been, I guess I've been doing spiritual things. And then she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, you know, sometimes I paint. I, <laughs> like I do a little yoga. And then she's like, Becky, that is not what I meant. And I was like, okay, well, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> you well, know? Let, let me say it this way. Of course I have very, religious beliefs and my religious <laughs> belief is that we're all in this together <laughs> <laughs> right, right. well right so I, I i wasn't out at all um there was a moment once when i was you know i lived in oklahoma and so i asked hi oh this, <laughs> this is th this is a dorgy it's yeah. a yeah, it's a it's a dachshund corgi mix and you can see he's got one eye that's a different color than the yeah, other one. It's really pretty yeah and he's blonde his name is Bowie. Oh, huh? oh that's perfect. <laughs> that's awesome. No, no, I was I was sitting I was sitting in I, I went into the lunchroom at work in Oklahoma and the topic of conversation were how atheists were really Satanists who worshiped the devil. 
And <clears throat> my response was, oh, that's funny. I didn't think that they believed in Satan either. And they all laughed. They were like, ha, 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 you're so naive, Rebecca. You know? And I was like, ha, 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 ah, what do I know? You know? <laughs> <laughs> And then later, the, the conversation went on. It eventually shifted to um, one of them's son was in China saving all the Satanists. And I was like, in that's China. funny. Right, right. And that's what I said. I was like, in China, I thought that they were like Buddhist or something. And she said, no, they're atheists. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, and I had to straight face this. I had to make it look like, like I didn't think she was an idiot. You know, I had to try real hard. <laughs> okay, there so. there are people that I know well that I'm you know that you know I, I won't go into all who all they are, but I mean there there are people I know that when I go into their space and I, we talk about anything topical, you know, what happened to the news or whatever, I mean suddenly left becomes right, up becomes down, forward becomes sideways. You know, it's it's really disorienting to try to re-educate everything. You know, it, it turns into this world where, where Obama is a Muslim socialist who's going to be putting us all in FEMA camps any minute. Still. <laughs> I, know, I, 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 know, I know someone like that. Yeah, I know one of those. Just yeah. one, though. <clears throat> okay, so you, 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 your family sees you on CNN. You, they see that your house has been destroyed. There's this huge tragedy. They've got so many things going on in their mind. And then you drop that bomb. <laughs> uh, you know what honestly it couldn't have come at a better moment in some ways because they couldn't like do like they couldn't be as upset <laughs> <laughs> they were so happy i lived and i had just gone through a tragedy so you know what were they gonna do <laughs> so my mom she cried she did cry my mom cried and sh and she said but you're not really an atheist because you believe in a higher power and i said mom i wouldn't have said atheist if i believed something different like i wouldn't have gone with the word atheist like out of nowhere not knowing what the, the connotations were and then my dad said don't let those people let you be their spoke or, or make you their spokesperson <laughs> that's, that's his comment oops why didn't you tell I, me that we've <laughs> We've had you on stage so many times already. <laughs> right. It's okay. He's a Tea Party activist, and if it makes him mad, then I'm doing something right, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm positive. Uh, and so, right. So my parent, yeah, everybody Sorry, found out that way. Party. He's I, a Tea Party activist. He's beyond reason. <laughs> right, right. Like, if he's going to say, you know, like, don't let them make you their spokesperson, I'm like, well, whatever. You know. So... Right. They well. So my my parents actually found out the same way the internet did, like a YouTube clip on Facebook. Like you know, mm -hmm. it's fine. Uh, so I got back from that interview and I called my husband right away. And it's funny because I didn't really real think much of it. I thought, oh no, our families were watching. That's about it. And so I called him and he said, how did the interview go? And I said, oh, wait, great. But there was this weird part at the end um, where he asked me if I thanked the Lord. And he said, oh, no, what did you say? Because <laughs> he knows me. Um, and, like, if I said no, it would have been really awkward. Like, just no. I'm, and I'm not going to not say no and say yes. Like, he knows I'm not going to say that. And he, I said so he, he said, oh, my, uh, oh, no, what did you say? And I said, I said I was an atheist. And he's like, no, my grandparents were watching that. <laughs> you know? And I, he was with his dad at the time. And I was like, I think you should probably tell your dad. <laughs> you know, his, <laughs> his dad hadn't found out yet. And he was with him. And they just were at tell the... Him, just tell him later you were kidding. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> at a moment like that. <laughs> Right. That's why I laughed so hard after I said it. <laughs> so that was a huge joke. <laughs> <laughs> and not because it was super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, speaking of speaking of super awkward, I remember also the story that you gave about how you're rummaging through the the rubble that was, you know, and and the other people that were supposedly helping out with this. Yeah, that was odd. one word could be awkward. <laughs> Another <laughs> word could be uh, deplorable. <laughs> um, right. So I was, um, yeah, I had I, some volunteers had come, uh, a couple of different teams of volunteers had come um, 
but the last day I was getting, I was, I was finishing the very last things and I had, I had hold, held one thing off because it was going to be painful and I was like, oh, this one's going to hurt. Um, and I had put all this baby clothing aside for my son uh, from when, it, you know, uh, I was going to make a quilt with it. I, I get crafty and sentimental, and I think of, like, 95-year-old me all the time. I love thinking about 95-year-old me and the things that will make me so happy when I'm 95 and can't do anything. <laughs> so one of them was going to have this baby quilt where I could be like, oh, I remember that, or whatever. And so I had set aside all this clothes. It had been completely destroyed. It was covered in insulation and debris, and my mind was saying, asbestos, lead, mercury, you know, like, it was, I was never going to be able to be comforted at 95 thinking I was, you know, yeah, I wouldn't so have just, even made it to 95. <laughs> this is a brief aside. The condition of your house, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about you going through your stuff as if you oh, yeah. still have a, a place to put stuff. So yeah, I no, right, it was knee level um, right after the storm. Like, uh, imagine just a house and now it's like knee level. Like, that was what I was going through. Okay. So, um, Not a wall standing. No, 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 no. Um, okay. The only thing that was standing was, uh, you know how your bathtub has like, it's like a fiberglass bathtub and so it has the fiberglass like a uh, wall. Me? Yeah, like your shower. Yeah. And so it'll go up the wall. That uh, Apparently those stand up after a tornado. So that's good. But okay. yeah, right. And, and that might have protected me except for I saw nothing but two by fours and broken dishes inside of the tub. So... <laughs> Well, you know, I, I and I know that people say to, to go to the central room of the house and go into the bathtub and everything. I, I personally saw an F5 tornado uh, here in Texas that was uh, it wiped the whole town off the map uh, in the late 1990s. And when I saw this tornado hit this house, I saw the house blow up, essentially. And the, yeah, that's the, that's the way I describe it. It looks like it looked like it had blown up. Yeah, well, I just watched it <clears throat> like that. And and the thing is that that bathtub, I saw the bathtub. It was like 300 feet in the air going 80 miles an hour. and <laughs> Probably right. not the safest place to be in the house. Well, there was no, no place safe in that house. It just... No. Well, and that's, and that's, what, I, that's what made me flee was uh, right, right whenever I left, um, I think this, the, the tornado was at that point five miles away, and they said, uh, you need to be underground for this storm cellar or basement. Uh, interior closet or bathroom is not enough. Car, uh, no, car is not enough. Interior closet or bathroom is not enough. And I was like, wow, I've got it. It's not enough. <laughs> you know, I was in the bathroom. <laughs> so that's what made me jet. Um, but yeah, at that, at, at that point, right. There were, you know, there, most of the stuff just got shoveled to the curb, but this thing, uh, you know, these were going to be hard. So I, I decided I was going to take these pictures of the clothes um, and so I took, I took these pictures and while we were doing this, um, I was with two Baptist women and they said, so which church do you go to? <laughs> you know, while you're sifting through the rubble of your life. Right. Right. Well, while I'm doing that. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to drop like the A-bomb, like atheist, <laughs> you know, or whatever. I didn't know. I didn't know what would happen if I did. And I really needed their help. I didn't want to get rid of them or anything. So I said, oh, I don't go to church. And they, uh, the woman, like she furrowed her brow and everything at me. And she said, you're raising this baby without Jesus, you know? And it was just, oh, oh, it reverberates in my mind with such anger because, you know, she's calling my parenting into question. I'm going through my baby's destroyed belongings. You know, this is really heart wrenching stuff. And then she's sitting there trying to like attack me because I'm, and this baby, like calling my son, this baby, like just that, I mean, all of it made me so mad. <laughs> it made me mad that I couldn't tell her, am I allowed to curse? I don't know if I can curse. Uh, F off, you know, like just, I wanted to get her out of my face, but I couldn't. Because Say I what you help. want. There's no censors on this show. Nice. <laughs> right. I wanted her to fuck off big time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have flipped her off so much, so hard, and felt really good internally about it. <laughs> but I couldn't. So I instead said, yep. <laughs> you know, just, yep. You know, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm raising this baby without Jesus. You know, like, I don't know what she's going to do with that information now. <laughs> okay, I got I to gotta, I gotta share something with you. And I, I, I remember like 1992, three or something, 1993, there was a tornado going through Iowa. 
and it was in the news and the, the, the tornado's coming to this house and it jumps up off the ground, skips over the house and goes back and tears up this field as it's heading toward town. And everybody that's in town goes and hides in the one solid building that they have. It's a very tiny little farming community in Iowa. And so the tornado comes to another house again, lifts up, skips the house, chairs up the field and heads on into the downtown area. Everybody in town hides in the church. The only building destroyed was the church. Everybody in the town was killed except for a half a dozen people who oh. thanked God <laughs> okay. for saving them. Yeah. Yeah. Destroying the building they're in and killing everyone in the town that they know. But they're thanking God for saving them. Yeah. And it That's... why didn't what about the two houses that the tornado skipped over? If yeah, I'm thinking if there was a God, he could have skipped that. You know, so what it looked like to me, since the tornado didn't skip over the church, it looked to me like if there was a God, he he was obviously bowling for Christians. <laughs> right. Well, I say that all the time about Oklahoma. I'm just like, it's really funny that there's such a high, you know, density of the population believing in Christianity since he's trying to wipe it off the map. You know? <laughs> and every time they make one of those giant Jesus statues, the you know, lightning strikes it and sets it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're talking about something specific to Oklahoma, which I thought was hilariously funny. But anyway, okay, <laughs> back to you dealing with this woman. And she wasn't the only one that was like... No, no, there were two of them. And so they spent the next 30 minutes trying to convert me. And they were telling me, you know... God had put them in my life because they were they, he missed me so much and he wanted to bring my son back home to him and so let me let me make sure let me us. make sure I understand this. Uh, so God sent a tornado to destroy your house. Sent it, yes. <laughs> so yep. that he could send these two biddies to you. <laughs> these two, yeah. He's he 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 really wanted them to cross paths with me so that they could save me. Uh, <clears throat> and I was, you know. I, I seem like I'm perfectly capable of saving myself. <laughs> uh, and so, but yeah, no, they were doing that. It was pissing me off. I, I, you know, I kept thinking, oh, my God, how do I make you stop but keep you here for your helping hands to continue doing what I need you to do? So instead, I gave them tasks that were on the other side of the house. I was just like, you go do this, go to that. You know, and I put them on the other side of the house, even though those things I didn't even really need done. I mean, I wanted them to get done, but realistically, I would have rather, you know, focus on the things that I really needed to get done. <laughs> and those were just like supplemental things that I had hoped for and had already kind of thought, well, I'm not going to get to do it. But good, I got those done. Yay. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, it was pretty funny because at the very end, like, okay, so what I ended up doing this entire time while, you know, every single time that they were talking, I was just like, I am going to make sure our people aren't doing this shit. <laughs> you know, if they're in somebody's house right now and they're making them feel like shit about who they are, if they're like in a Christian's house and they're just like, where was your God when this happened? <laughs> you know, I was just like, I'm going to go stop them because that's that's a dick thing to do. Well, no, no, you, you, you're jumping the gun. You're jumping to the end of the story when you're talking about, you know, make sure that your people aren't doing this. We don't have. No, that was then. Yet. That was happening right at the moment. That's when that stuff <laughs> popped in the first time. Okay. That's well, yeah, that's whenever I had my first my first thoughts of that was just like I've got to find our people because I figured we had people already there. Like I just assumed that there was some atheist organization out there in the cleanup and they were, you know, helping people out and and I just hoped they weren't being dicks. And I kind of like kept my fingers crossed. And I was like, I'm sure they're not really being dicks. I'm sure they're being really awesome. I bet if they're actually out there, they're really nice. And I don't know. I've, I've met quite a few atheists. They can really be dicks. I know they can be dicks. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had to like cross fingers, you know, like I hope it's the humanists. <laughs> and so I, I, I ended up, uh, you know, thinking that I would go volunteer with them or whatever. And that's what, you know, the wheels were turning and I was just like, I'm going to go volunteer with them. I'm going to help. I'm, I, that's what I'm going to do with my time. I'm going to go help other people. And so, so, so to recap, you're, 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 you're rummaging through the rubble of your house. Yes. You're, you're getting not, not very much assistance from these people at a time that you really don't need this kind of guff. And right. all the while you're thinking that there, there must be, or should be some kind of secular. Relief. Must be is the right term. I never thought like never once during that time did it occur to me that that wasn't there. 
at all. I just, it was there. <laughs> like it, it already existed. And so, right. Well, so, and then this woman at the very end said, well, I hope I've inspired you, <laughs> you know? And I said, oh, you have. <laughs> <laughs> I totally did. And, and I knew inside, I knew inside exactly what that meant, but she smiled. <laughs> like, she was really pleased with herself. And you know what? Whatever. Like I got her to help me. She helped me. Great. And she did inspire me and, and, and good on her because look, a lot of atheists are going to help a lot of people because of that lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, well, well, fill us in on, on the, how your idea developed. Right. Well, okay. So, right. I, after that, I went, well, I didn't go home. I went to a friend's house and I started Googling. I was just like. You, and mean, I kept, what, you went home. <laughs> right. I was thinking, you no, know, then I went home. No, I didn't go home. I went to a friend's house and then I started Googling, you know, like atheist uh, disaster relief or, you know, humanist disaster relief, disaster relief, secular. Like I was just trying to put things in. Satanic. <laughs> right. Satanic temple, disaster relief. No, I, I didn't put that one in. But, you know, I, I was, I kept thinking, am I just putting the wrong keywords into Google? Do I, maybe it's some stupid name like points of light, you know, starstruck happiness. I don't know. You know, like some, some, some weird, you know, thing that doesn't self describe properly. And so then I, you know, at this point, I had a few, you know, contacts with atheist people and I was able to find out, no, it didn't exist. <laughs> like, and that people knew it didn't exist. Like higher up people, you know, understood that it didn't exist. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, that's not okay at all in any way whatsoever. Uh, you know, cause I kept thinking, I was just like, how is it possible for it to not to exist? If we want to live in a world that doesn't have religion, what happens when disasters happen? <laughs> like, we have atheist charities all over the place, so why wouldn't we have atheist emergency? Response? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't make any sense at all. And 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 honestly, to live in a world that doesn't have religion, you have to be able to do these kinds of jobs. And so, I um, started, you know, talking everyone's ear off, trying to find what I could do because I was like, I can't do this alone. Like clearly, I can't do this alone. I'm not skilled in this area. <laughs> like, right? I'm not. I, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'm not like, yeah, I can take this on and like totally do it. That's, yeah. I, that's I'm the confident. attitude I always have just before I fail. <laughs> right, right. I'm pretty sure that, that that's the that's the mark of a failure is that I can definitely do this giant thing alone. <laughs> you know? I think famous last words are, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so finally I, I met somebody uh, or a friend of mine. Her name was uh, Christy Dawson. She's the she was the founder of Oklahoma Secular Parenting. Said, "Oh, Dale McGowan's going to be here in about a week, and you should talk to him." And I was like, "Okay, he writes like secular parenting books, but how does that help me?" <laughs> you know. And she said, "Oh, well, you should. He does. He's the founder of Foundation Beyond Belief. You should look into it." And so then I went home and I googled Foundation Beyond Belief, and they had two different programs. Um, well, they had three, how many, they had a few programs going on, uh, and two of them, uh, one of them was Volunteers Beyond Belief, which is now Beyond Belief Network, where they have 119 volunteer teams across the country who are putting in hours. I think they just went over 100,000 hours that they've put into their local communities, which is amazing, and this is just, you know, humanists working in their local communities, 100,000 hours. That's awesome. But also 119 teams. I think they were in 35 states. And so that is a tremendous um, volunteer outreach. And then they also were raising money for disasters. They had raised, you know, maybe 65000 for one disaster and thirty five for another and forty eight for another. And so they were very good at fundraising for disasters and at volunteer organizations around the country and it's like you guys just combine the two like this is this is you guys have this this is exactly what you should be doing and so i approached dale mcgowan that you know the next week and before that though i i spent an entire week writing out like this is how you should do this these are the things you would need this is the kind of this is how you would get it done la la la, la. and so i approached him basically with like an elevator speech, like prepared. And then he was like, you know what, Noel George, who just 
took his place as executive director of Foundation Beyond Belief. He said, Noelle George has approached uh, me with this idea in the past, and I really think I should put you in touch with her. And so I got in touch with Noelle, and then we were going back and forth, and then we decided, okay, well, you know, at least put this in the brainstorming phase. And then we started with that, and then it moved on and progressed and progressed and progressed, and then it became a, it became an endeavor. <laughs> I, I, I donated more than a thousand hours one year and like, you know, like just, you know, because I'm a volunteer and so I'm, you know, just doing all this stuff. But uh, we had uh, a woman working up with us, Samantha Montano, who was getting her doctorate in emergency management and she, you know, basically made sure that we did everything right uh, along the way. And so that was awesome, except for it made it a lot more work because things like, uh, you know, what we've just, you know, what has been discovered by uh, people who study emergency management is that trained volunteers are much better at doing what they should do once they're in these environments that they've never been in before. Because you know, you're suddenly cast into this environment you've never been in, and you expect it to behave in a similar way to your normal life, and it doesn't in any way whatsoever. It's counterintuitive in a lot of ways. Um, <clears throat> And so it was really awesome to have her on there. Um, we ended up developing a couple of trainings uh, along the way. We have um, the first one is uh, introduction to HDR teams, which prepares you for the environment, it pre prepares you for thinking like a humanist whenever you're within the environment, how you're supposed to interact and um, think about things and what not to do and stuff like that. And then the other one is um, introduction to disasters and that specifically goes over different types of disasters and understanding really the emergency management field in general so that you understand what you're doing why you're doing it exactly the way you're doing it and you know how a lot of people are doing things very very wrong when it comes to disasters give me give me an example of something that people do wrong okay <laughs> um, okay so one of the worst things that people do is called uh, spontaneous volunteering it's whenever you see something on the screen and you're like oh, I need to help them and I need to help them now they need me <laughs> that seems intuitive to your brain doesn't it it's <laughs> I've felt that way I've looked at a screen and been like no they need me I I'm available and I have hands, you know, <laughs> you know, so you think Conf you I confess. I mean, I've seen a lot of the like flood footage, you know, where, where, where people are, are, are hanging on to tree limbs being dragged around and, and the, the desperate thing where they're like, they're going to go into the drainage ditch and there's the, the guy reaching out, trying to get them and can't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to be there to be just as futile. As <laughs> right. right. It's a human thing. It's a human thing. But, um, it has been shown very, very, very much so, and proven with lots and lots and lots of studies and statistics that that is a hindrance to emergency management in a big way. You get in the way of trained people who are trying to do their jobs. You end up taking up resources because now they have to provide food and water for you because you went there suddenly with no plan. <laughs> you know, um, and so uh, it also it stops people from being able to get immediately like uh, the kind of care that they need. Also what people end up doing, so spontaneous volunteering, like whenever it came to the World Trade Center, 40,000 people flocked there. 40,000 flocked there and basically they got in the way of emergency management doing their jobs Whenever you, and basically what they do when they get there is they try to find somebody in emergency management to give them a job. So they're getting in the way, they're taking up brain power that's supposed to be used on actually taking care of the situation. And instead they have to say, I don't have a job for you. I've got to focus, you know, or whatever, you know, they are just, you know, they end up with the World Trade situation. Center, 40,000 people just pick up a brick. Huh? <laughs> Everybody pick up a couple of bricks. <laughs> well, the thing is that you got a lot of people who are injured and you're trying to get those people to medical care as soon as possible. And then, you know, whenever you have those types of um, environments go down along with them with any type of um, trade that was going on in there, like if people used to go in there to get food or something, now they can't go there. And so now they need all of like all of the resources that were in within those buildings that people counted on now they need resources from outside of that environment so they're going to the local area that surrounds that environment and so they're you know suddenly dependent on those kinds of things but then you have 40,000 people come in and they all need to be provided for as well 
on an already labored system and so it just all goes to shit <laughs> and a lot of those people also don't know what they're doing because they're not trained so they end up injuring themselves and so you have way more injuries because of you know, this 40,000 people who don't know what they're doing all on, <laughs> on chunks of concrete and rebar and glass yeah and so right exactly so you end up with way more injuries and so you get the um, medical people are flooded in ways that they wouldn't be if you weren't there. And so anyway, it ends up being um, just statistically a bad idea uh, to not go through a system. Now, see, so it, being, okay. being a human, you know, and just, you said this is a human thing. I look at this kind of the same way that ants are. I mean, you know, the, the building goes down, everybody scrambles to, to, to you know, in, in hyper speed, just like ants do, you know, take care of the mess is what, you know, when you talk about the, the, the trade center, that's what I'm thinking. But of course, like, it's it is like what what you're saying when you everybody's crawling around with no boots or gloves on all of this debris it's kind of a bad thing um, yeah but. yeah it, it, yeah there's lots of studies that have been done that show that it's just a, a really bad idea and it ends up hindering uh, emergency management from being able to do what they're supposed to do and so what you are supposed to do and what emergency management wants you to do is to still go because going and they do need your help and everything like that, but they want to wait until the environment is ready to receive you. And that's basically it. Um, it's, it's, it's just basically, it's just slightly counterintuitive because going is right. Going is right, but waiting until the environment is prepared by those emergency personnel so that it can receive people who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> because that's they do get it to that point. They get it to the point where they're, they've gone from the response phase. This is called the response phase. Any The life-saving uh, measures, um, you know, food, providing food for people who are coming in and, and things like that. Um, removing debris so that you can get to the area and and start working and providing things like shovels and you know safety equipment and stuff like that once that is all there then yes volunteers come 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 and they'll announce that they'll say we're ready to move into the recovery phase and then the organizations who are involved in recovery which like we are now humanist disaster recovery teams that's why it says recovery in our name specifically is we are for the recovery phase. And so, right, you move from the response phase, which is life-saving, and then you move into the recovery phase, which is now we need tons and tons and tons of people to come help us pick up this giant mess. And that was the, the job that the two ladies were doing yes. with you at your house. And it wasn't just your house for a lot of other people to think about it. They're probably just thinking about like one house out in the country. It was an one entire house. suburban No, this was, <laughs> yeah, it was 1,200 homes. 1,200 homes, knee yeah. level knee level yeah oh yeah and a, a hospital and two three schools so it was real and businesses and all kinds of things it was a whole city basically i mean it was just a town that was just obliterated normally when you see tornado damage normally there's like one building that manages to get on the news you like everybody goes hide in the school and then the school is the one thing that gets crushed you know it, normally that's the kind of thing we see we don't usually see an entire town no Except unless it's more Oklahoma, because this is the third time more has been taken out. <laughs> 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 this is its third F5 that went directly through the entire town. And I'm just confused why they keep building it and don't just make it a topography memorial plot. <laughs> like You're just like, topography is not in this town's favor. It's all over here now. <laughs> you know? The same thing with Gerald, Texas, which is the town that got hit by the FI that I saw that that took that wiped everything out. It took the asphalt off the road. Oh, that's F five. Yeah, that's one of the <laughs> yeah, that's one of the specific things that they say for F five is takes off asphalt. I saw a, a the foundation foundation for a house that was folded in half. Wow. So cool. that's a concrete that broke, and then the rebar is still connected, and it's folded over like that. So I mean. In an incredible amount of destructive force. And all we saw in the news was a, a long line of ambulances and hearses from other towns yeah. going to go pick things up. And I remember driving through this area once upon a time and I see a single wide trailer house because why the hell do people live in trailer houses in places like Oklahoma and Texas? But there's this, well, it's because <laughs> assholes will sell them. <laughs> well, there's a single wide trailer house on top of a small hill, because that's all we have in Texas is small hills. But it's, it's sitting right there on the top. And I'm thinking that 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 to me looks like the a bowling pin at the end of a lane. <laughs> You're just daring. 
<laughs> daring them to come get you. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a friend who lived in a trailer in Oklahoma, and I always felt just a little, like, unnerved that they that they live there during the spring. I'm just like, how do you survive the spring? Like the anxiety <laughs> would kill me. <laughs> like, it was just, I couldn't do it. But you know what? It's usually what's sad is that it's usually people who can't afford anything else. And and so it's sort of like it's really annoying to think that. I I almost feel like whoever sold it to them is like taking advantage of the fact that they can't afford more or something. I don't know. I just always feel like like something's not right there and somebody is making money they shouldn't be making because they're being dicks. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you mentioned this, you mentioned the spring, right? Well, we're, we're in February now, but the next month is March and of course, April. And this is when, and, and May is our season for tornadoes. Mm -hmm. So the, the next three months are, are going to be the season for disaster. Uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. So people that live in danger areas are like, like this, how can they get involved? What can they do? What should they do? So uh, to be involved with uh, humanist disaster recovery teams, you should uh, go to foundationbeyondbelief.org slash HDR teams, and then you can sign up uh, there. Another thing that I would suggest people do um, is prepare. <laughs> um, you know, if, uh, if you live in an area that has tornadoes, what you should be doing is taking CERT classes. That's C-E-R-T. Um, it's Community Emergency Response Teams. And this is given for free by FEMA. Um, and this is done all over the place. Like uh, if you look up right now inside of your town, I'm sure that they have these free CERT trainings. And so what CERT does is they prepare you to take part in the response phase, not just recovery, so that you understand what you're doing and you can actually take part and be part of the life-saving measures. You can go into a, a, a building that's been destroyed and know whether or not you should actually go in that building. <laughs> and um, they just completely prepare you in every way. Uh, they make you, they, you know, they make you buy the supplies that you need. They tell you exactly what you need and it's catered specifically to your region. And so if you are in, um, you know, Dallas, for instance, it'll be going over things like tornadoes and floods and things like that. It won't be going over earthquakes because that's not, you're never going to be in a response um, situation in an earthquake in Dallas. And so... Or a volcano. Or a volcano, right. <laughs> and so where I live, though, I we do have those kinds of things. I went to my CERT training here, and so I know how to lift a thousand pound beam off of somebody who's being crushed by it. I know how to do that. Ha ha ha. You know? <laughs> um, but they, <laughs> they teach you how to, you know, uh, specifically so that you are in the emergency management system properly, you're trained and everything. And I would suggest highly to anybody who is living in basically any area at all. Sorry, I, I suddenly have, um, I gotta close this. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, you can't hear it, but I can. My mom's calling on the other line. <laughs> she, she froze your face in the video. In, in... Oh no, it looks bad too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very bad expression. <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> That's fine. I'll just stay that way. That's good. <laughs> well, you can turn the camera off. And okay, then, let me you know, <laughs> and wait a moment and you can turn it back on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Smart. Okay, if it ever comes back. Did you ever give a uh, a website to people to go to, but other than the yes. uh, training and everything, you went to? No, it's uh, foundationbeyondbelief.org slash HDR teams. And so that, specifically HDR teams, what we do is we want to focus specifically on um, times. Oh, I know what happened. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to get my, um, my pretty face back on the thing. <laughs> okay. Well, while you're doing that, I want to tell, uh, tell another one, okay. you know, another anecdote there uh, for anybody who cares. There, there was a point where there was a tornado headed for our house and it was announced on the news. I got, and I got a call from somebody saying that, you know, it's showing on Doppler radar. It's headed straight for you. I see it on the TV screen. Sure enough, headed straight for me. I step out on the front porch and I can't see the end of my driveway because of the torrential rain. And it's, it's dark and it's, it's raining buckets and I can barely hear the tornado siren and I can hear screaming just kind of muffled in the rain. And I remember telling my son to, to put on his steel-toed boots. And I get, I get yelled at 
for telling my son to put on his steel-toed boots. And I'm thinking, you know, if the house gets reduced to rubble and he's alive, he's going to want those boots and he will not be able to find them because <laughs> he's going to have to walk over rubble. Uh, other people weren't Absolutely. Thinking. Yeah. So what? No, I, yeah, my, my tornado pack, uh, yeah, we had to totally dig that out. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those. It so when you just... say that to people to prepare and they're taking these courses, is I mean, do they have their own shovels? Do you have, is there equipment that you're supposed to get on your own? Um, whenever, you're taking, whenever you're taking CERT classes, they will have you uh, buy some things on your own. For instance, I have um, a hard hat and work gloves. I have um, boots and uh, earplugs, eye goggles, um, face masks. Those kinds of things. Um, yeah, they'll have you buy the kinds of things that will keep you safe so that you have them whenever you need them immediately. And so the thing is, as soon as you want to be involved in response, um, a lot of other people will too, and they're going to rush to the types of places that sell those things, and they're going to sell out pretty fast. So you're going to want to already have those on hand and be prepared. Um, the thing about it too is you'll know what you're doing, and so you won't be hindering the environment like the spontaneous volunteers that I was speaking of earlier. And so you can be involved in response, and that is a, a really admirable and wonderful thing to do properly. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything that, that your organization does that maybe other groups don't or that, you're, that, that, that you should tell us about that would be interesting? Um, you know, the thing that I think the thing that sets us apart the most is that we uh, come at uh, disaster recovery from a humanist perspective specifically. Um, and so what we do is we kind of go over training how to think like a humanist whenever you're in a certain situation with a survivor or with another volunteer who doesn't think the way you do. We, we don't want to get into um, debates. So when you yeah. show up to somebody's laid waste rubble uh, and they say, thank God I'm alive, you don't respond like, you know, does this look like the work of God to you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, no, 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 no. They're human beings. And honestly, uh, you know, specifically there's uh, psychological um, evidence that people need to cling to things like faith in a moment like that because their world is completely destroyed and so their mind at that moment um, is very close to snapping in a lot of ways. It's very traumatic and, and the things that they're taking away from that moment are gonna be traumatizing in a lot of ways, especially if anything negative happens outside of the uh, already negative environment that they found themselves in. For instance, like when somebody, while you're going through your baby's destroyed belongings, tries to berate you for not believing in religion, you're going to cling to that in some way, <laughs> um, and it's going to affect you in a in a traumatizing manner. Luckily, I they call what I did PTSG, which is post traumatic stress growth, which is nice. <laughs> it's whenever you take something traumatizing and you make something good out of it. It's when you get all <laughs> Nietzsche about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but 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 what we end up um, talking about is you know uh, who they are is very important at that time. Who they believe you know that they are. You know your camera still doesn't work, right? Yeah, I do. I I was <laughs> thinking that I should take it off entirely and try to come back to the conversation. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Keep going. Okay. Um, and so what they uh what they say is that uh, during times of trauma what you end up needing to remind people of is who they are so that they can remember who they are because one of the most important things that can get you through that moment is this memory of who you are that either makes you feel positive or neutral. As long as it's not, you know, like d devastating and terrible, then it's doing something good because it's getting you through, it's getting you through coping with this trauma that you're trying to do. And so that I think is why people reach to religion so quickly because it's this sense of peace, even if it doesn't make any sense. Like, even if, if you were us and you were just like, dude, everyone else died. That's insane. <laughs> you know, um, to them at that moment, they're just trying to get through trauma. And so they like, what feels good? What feels good? God, God feels good. <laughs> you know, And so <laughs> they just go with it because it's what they have to do at that moment. And so um, we just don't feel like it's appropriate for us to interrupt uh, their coping mechanisms um, and their process. And everybody comes at uh, a tragedy, or actually just life in general, from an individual perspective. And so um, 
making sure that they're allowed to be who they are at that moment is basically the best thing you can possibly do is like provide a safe environment for them to be themselves. Yeah, I don't know how I would deal with it. I mean, in your situation, you you lost a house, you lost a lot of belongings. But I mean, so far as I remember from your story, uh, you, you, your husband, you, your baby, even your cats. Lived. Yes, they, they managed <laughs> yeah. to survive this. And I, I, I've seen news stories where the little old lady would lose her dog, you know, in, in a tragedy like that. And I don't know how to deal with that. But if somebody had lost their child or their, you know, their spouse or yeah. something, my, that happened to my neighbors, uh, you know, across the street, um, one lost the mom and then another lost the daughter. And so like in a moment like that, you just, however it is that they are making it by, you just let them basically, yeah. unless, unless they aren't making it. And that's whenever you step in and you try to remind them of who they are or try to remind them, you know, um, just positive or neutral. If so you bring this, them this to a positive or neutral space. This would be something where I would need training because I, I don't I don't know how to deal with that kind of grief and bereavement. I don't even know how to deal with it in myself. I, I mean, I'm definitely, definitely. And that's and that's that's definitely something um specifically uh <clears throat> in dealing with uh bereavement specifically, there's a training that I want to eventually give. We weren't able to yet because of you know funding and things like that. Uh we weren't able to do it. But specifically it's called um CRIM Community Resiliency Model it was developed by a woman named Elaine, and it's a pretty amazing thing because it, it makes it very simple. It makes it, um, basically what you, you do is you, you try to help somebody come up with a list of resources, like things that always make them feel happy or neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then have them speak about one of their resources, and while they're speaking about it, like you have them notice the changes in their physiology, like if they smile or if they give like a, a like if they take a deep breath and they feel like a little bit better you say you say oh did you notice you took a deep breath and then bringing attention and awareness to the positive or neutral physiology brings them back into their frontal lobe and then they're able to process better because what ends up happening during trauma and if somebody's um reacting to a trauma what's happened is their amygdala has fired and so they're in fight or flight mode and so they're freaking out but it's really that their amygdala has fired and you have to bring them back into their frontal lobe. So one of the first things is that you have to pull them into feeling their body again. So one of them is resourcing and then, um, you know, amplifying the resource. But another one is just called grounding where you're supposed to literally feel your body. Like right now you're sitting in a chair. So you try to think about what your legs are doing and what it feels like to feel the chair against your legs. And if your feet are touching the floor, then you need to feel what your feet feel like touching the floor because that's, a very neutral thing and it's also making you feel your body and all of that takes place in the frontal lobe so it pulls you out of your amygdala um, and basically your amygdala stops firing you're pulled into your frontal lobe and then you're able to cope and so there uh, are very very simple ways in which to bring people back down whenever they're panicking in uh, a traumatic situation okay mouthful <laughs> <laughs> It's not hard, what I'm trying to say. And that's a reason why we have training. Yay. <laughs> uh, could, and that's the, yeah. If I could, what did you do before this? Because, I mean, you, you've obviously done a whole lot of investment of study uh, after that event. I mean, I, I, I never asked what you did before that. I mean, you know, um, so one of, the, one of the things that influences what I do now that I did before um, is I, I used to coordinate volunteers. <laughs> I actually have a, <laughs> I have a national award. It was like um, they gave out seven out of 250 students, uh, 250,000 students that year uh, for volunteer coordination. So I'm, I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> um, and then um, I was a math tutor, though, uh, for a long time. And then I, for a while, so I, I, I was being a stay-at-home mom to my son, and before that, I was a nanny for three years because I didn't want to have a kid without guinea-pigging other people's kids first. Guinea-pigging other <laughs> Yeah, but it broke another one. <laughs> right, right, I, right. I wanted to make sure. Also, I didn't want to like have a baby and be like, oh, this was a mistake. I'm not meant to be a parent. This was a bad idea. Like, I wanted to make sure that I was all in. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to fail on someone else's kid first, or maybe like a few of their kids. <laughs> like, but I did actually, I, I did a really good job actually uh, with the nanny thing. And then um, once I was ready to breed, essentially, <laughs> I uh, got like a desk job because I didn't want to be taking care of three kids while 
uh, pregnant. That sounded like a miserable thing to do. <laughs> and so I, right, so, so basically, yeah, whenever the tornado struck, I was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, so the tornado really took out not only my uh, ho home life, but it also took out my entire work <laughs> existence as well. Um, and the thing that, you know, it's... Which makes me have to throw out another anecdote. Living here in Texas, uh, you know, it, it, um, the former wife uh, was going to go to work and there was a tornado coming. We didn't realize it was a tornado, right? Uh, I'm already at work. She can't get the door open. Um, and, and when she finally does, when she gets a roommate to help her open the door, uh, he can't get it closed because of the pressure and everything. Uh, tornado hits our house and then hits my work. I saw the clouds rolling. It was a very impressive display. I was working in a little convenience store back then. It was many years ago. And suddenly both doors blew open and basically the contents of the store left. And I got to see uh, lumber, uh, two by fours and stuff, floating down the street at very slow speed, traveling along with cars. It would be car, 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 two by four, car. And they're all traveling at about the same speed from each other. And I, I saw the tornado. You could barely see it. It was wrapped in rain. And it, it went across the street and it caused one of the, the, the walls to breathe in this one bank. And then it went to my wife's work and took the roof off wow. before she got there. Wow. Yep. So it was our house, my work, her work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's well that's Go ahead. You there? Rebecca? So we spent an entire show talking about tragedies and, and, and such, and suddenly she's mysteriously and abruptly knocked off the air. Uh, it was very close to the end of the show anyway, and I think we've said pretty much everything that we needed to say. Um, I don't know that she's going to be able to make it back in the next couple of minutes because I don't know what happened to her system, but I, I'm sure she's all right, and I will I will find out. All right, uh, so uh, anybody... I, if, we went to this... Um, audio only thing accidentally because her camera gave out and but we were talking at one point about possibly going audio only for a number of shows if not all of them uh, for the opportunity of being able to take calls that's something i'm exploring uh, as an option and uh, be interested in some feedback all right so i'm going to let you guys go and thank you for watching